Our third and final speaker this evening is Dr. Robert Pascuzzi. He's the chair of the Department of Neurology at IU School of Medicine. The neurosciences are one of the school's highest priorities, and we have national expertise in Alzheimer's research, traumatic brain injury, neuroimaging, and genetic factors in neurological diseases. Dr. Pascuzzi is a national leader in research that focuses on therapeutic trials and neuromuscular diseases, including ALS, myasthenia gravis, and Lambert-Eaton syndrome. He served as the director of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and has been selected outstanding professor in neurology by the graduating medical school class at Indiana University on 26 occasions. We look forward to his talk this evening. Please help me welcoming, in welcoming Dr. Robert Pascuzzi. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate that. Looking for uh, my advancement uh, tools. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, it's a pleasure to be here and talk for a few minutes about a couple of things. Uh, Want to talk about creeping paralysis. And so uh, pretty be clear, what is creeping paralysis? That's the word on the street and in the hills going back 100 years for Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So uh, when you see somebody who has a family history from uh, 60 years ago as someone who had creeping paralysis. That's what they're referring to. It's a horrible disease. Uh, and hopefully in the next few minutes, uh, we'll learn a little bit about it, but we'll also uh, come away with some enthusiasm for getting to a point where we can actually treat this a whole lot better than we have been um, up to this point in time. And I'm also gonna put in um, uh, a joke. Uh, unless this gets uh, cut out uh, by the dean or somebody else. And it's, it's one of the best medical jokes uh, out there. I know we have a big audience of medical personnel. So it has to do with uh, Count Dracula. So it goes something like this. <clears throat> Three vampires walk into a bar in Carmel. And uh, bartender thinks that's a little creepy. Uh, and the first vampire says, uh, I want a glass of blood. And so he writes that down, the bartender does, and looks at the second vampire and says, I want a cold glass of blood. So he writes that down. And turns to the third vampire and says, how about you, pal? Third vampire says, I want a cold glass of plasma. And so bartender writes that down, scratches his head, thinks this is really weird. Looks, says, okay, let me get this straight. It's going to be two bloods and one blood light. I said, okay. I think, okay, so anyway, you can at least take that with you. Uh, but let's talk about the creeping paralysis. Disclosures, my only disclosure is I'm an IU person. Went to IU for everything except for some neurology training and been around here for many decades. So uh, IU is my home and that's my inherent bias. I'm gonna give you a case here. And this is intended to help um, make people less anxious, particularly since we have an audience of clinical people. Um, this is something that uh, I get consulted about uh, a couple times a month, typically by a physician. And uh, in this case, uh, one of my clinical colleagues uh, called and said that since Friday, um, had me able to sleep because the hand's twitching, it's flickering. So I said, well, uh, can you like show it to me? So they, they sent me a video. And look at the hand there, you see it flickers, it twitches. The inside of the hand twitches. The little finger uh, on the side, the, uh, it twitches out. Uh, so it looks like there's, there are twitches in between the thumb and the index finger. It's twitching a bit and the little finger's twitching. And uh, it turns out that when um, physicians uh, see these twitches and flickers, everybody gets twitches and flickers, as long as you don't know what they are, they don't really bother you that much. You know, your eye twitches, that sort of thing. But when physicians get this, oftentimes they know too much and they understand that muscle twitches are fasciculations. And fasciculations are something that uh, one sees in Lou Gehrig's disease, in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it's a natural fear. We just worry about these things. And uh, it, uh, so it's a reason to get checked out. The good news is nearly always uh, when somebody comes in to see a physician and their chief complaint is twitches and fasciculations, it's not Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, Lou Gehrig's patients present with other things, have other findings on exam. 
but it's our job as clinicians to try to make the distinction and be very clear about it. So anybody out there listening, if you get muscle twitches and flickers, particularly if you're a physician and you worry about this stuff, uh, you should be in pretty good shape, but feel free to call me. Uh, so we actually have the patients come in, we take a look at them, we conduct a complete exam looking to establish a reason for the twitches and fasciculations. We'll come back at the very end and uh, try to diagnose this individual. Um, but let's talk a little bit about Lou Gehrig, the iron horse. I think he's a very interesting figure, not so much because of his baseball uh, accomplishments, which were huge. Uh, so he, you know, he went to Columbia. He didn't go to IU. He went to Columbia and New York and was going to be an engineer, uh, played football, uh, also baseball. Uh, he uh, played in the summer league, which was not allowed then, so he got in some trouble. Uh, but then uh, in the professional uh, league, uh, he had an extensive uh, career for over a decade of hitting over 300 year after year. And his durability was incredible, became known as the Iron Horse, as his nickname, until uh, 1938, when his batting average dropped below 300 for the first time in a decade. Then uh, early, uh, earlier that uh, year in 39, then uh, his uh, uh, performance uh, really was poor at the beginning of the season. And so he went to the Mayo Clinic to be evaluated. And they evaluated, or they determined that he had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And so while we call this Lou Gehrig's disease here, most of the world calls it Charcot's disease. Charcot was the father of neurology, worked at the Salpetriere in Paris. He trained a generation of neurologists, and he's the one that first observed this condition, and his description of it is the basis for the clinical diagnosis that's made today. So what is the disease? It's basically an adult, uh, can be any age, more common in older people and younger people, and uh, they typically have the gradual development of weakness, loss of function, loss of muscle in one arm or one hand. That's where it starts, on one, one place in the body. And um, it uh, could start in a leg with a foot drop, very gradually developing. It's painless, there's no sensory loss, just a gradual decline in function. Muscle tends to shrivel up and atrophy. There are muscle fasciculations and twitches. And uh, over time, over months to years, the weakness progresses gradually and spreads. It's, if it starts in the left arm, it spreads to the right arm. If it starts in the left arm, it also eventually spreads down the left leg. Then it spreads up into the, the bulbar area. Uh, if it starts in a leg, it gradually spreads upward. In some patients, it starts in the speech and swallowing muscles. In, in those patients, it gradually spreads down into the neck, shoulders, arms. It's like it creeps along in the, in the central nervous system with a regional spread. And patients tend to progress fairly steadily at a steady rate. And what limits their survival to about two to five years on average is when it spreads to involve the diaphragm muscle. If the diaphragm's not working well enough, you can't breathe well enough, that's gonna limit your survival unless you go on a breathing machine like let's say uh, Stephen Hawking for a number of decades. Uh, so two to five years is the typical time frame it takes for most patients to reach a point where their breathing is that critical. But for some patients, it's a more rapidly progressive downhill slope. They don't survive a year. For other patients, it's a very slow course. We have some patients that have had it for 30 years. So it's progressing, but they're just losing ground a couple percent per year. Whatever slope you're on is the slope you stay on for the most part. And that's what it looks like. There are two different kinds of motor nerves in the brain and spine. And the two sets typically are both affected in this disease. So lower motor nerves go from the spinal cord straight out to the muscle and make the muscle contract. If the lower motor nerves malfunction, the muscles shrink up, atrophy, fasciculations. Upper motor neurons uh, begin up in the thinking part of the brain. So when you want to make your arm move, you have to initiate that by triggering a signal in the upper motor nerve. And if it's in the right side of the brain, it sends a signal down a wire, the axon that goes down to the bottom of the brain crosses over to the spinal cord on the other side, goes down the spinal cord and stops. And that upper motor nerve then hooks up with the lower motor nerve that goes out and serves the muscle. So any muscle you want to use, you have to have a, a hookup between the upper and lower motor nerve, like two electrical wires hooked up in series. If the upper motor nerves in the brain malfunction, patients have different findings on exam. They get stiff and tight, called spasticity. They get real jumpy reflexes when we tap on their reflexes. And uh, these, are, these are features of an examination that one can see. And the neurologist's findings are typically a combination of widespread lower motor neuron findings, widespread upper motor neuron signs, 
and a slow progressive course over time, and yet sensation is spared, cognition is typically spared, eye movements are spared, bladder and bowel function spared. And that's the clinical presentation that leads a neurologist to say, well, this is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And so that description comes courtesy of Charcot. It's not a common disease in the sense of Alzheimer's uh, or Parkinson's, but it's more common than you think. It affects one in 10,000 living people, so there's probably 700 patients in uh, Indiana now. One's lifetime risk of getting it is actually about one in 500. It has to do with the fact that the life expectancy is limited with this disease. And it's a progressive problem and eventually becomes very difficult to to manage for patients and their families, and there's pretty much nothing good about the disease. Pretty much nothing good. I think that's where we're at. Um, so uh, we have Charcot to thank for teaching 100 years of neurologists how to make the diagnosis. So we're at first base in the baseball metaphor. We know how to make the diagnosis. Neurologists do it. It's the neurologist disease. And here's a, just a brief example of what happened to a patient, uh, not unlike our patients, when Lou Gehrig got diagnosed at the Mayo Clinic, he went back to New York and uh, had his famous speech at Yankee Stadium. And then he uh, said, well, somebody has to know how to treat this. They said, well, we don't know how to fix this. And so he said, well, is there any research being done, any clinical trials? And so he found a clinical trial uh, in New York done by Israel Wexler, a very famous, well-known neurologist um, at Mount Sinai who was studying the effects of vitamin E on ALS. There was a theory that this was the source of it. And so Lou Gehrig volunteered for a clinical trial. That's what our patients do here. They say, well, how do we fix this disease? And we say, well, we have a couple of things that slow down the disease a little bit, but we don't have a fix for it. And so they say, well, what's out there in the way of research so we can find something better? Patients are motivated, their families are, and they're willing to contribute to, to the greater good. So Lou Gehrig went into this trial. It's interesting, when he, when he left the Mayo Clinic, he signed documents that um, prevented the Mayo Clinic from ever releasing his medical records for decades. But uh, when he was in this clinical trial, this was published uh, by Wexler. And so if you look at case number four of the 20 patients in the study, this is Lou Gehrig. So actually, his medical record is published. LG, male age 36, man had weakness in March of 1939. And if you go through the exam, it basically describes widespread lower motor neuron signs, widespread upper motor neuron signs. This description, uh, there's nothing else this condition can be besides ALS. What's interesting is the very bottom part where it says treatment with vitamin E was begun in February and continued to date. The fibrillations, and that was the term then for fasciculations, have practically disappeared. Walking is improved and some powers returned in the thumbs. The case may be regarded as definitely arrested and somewhat improved. So this is science, clinical trials, published, a uh, big journal. And uh, if you read this, you say, well, Lou Gehrig did pretty well. He was basically had his disease arrested and he's somewhat improved. And in fact, you look at the 20 patients in the study, most of them were improved. Some were recovered, marked improvement, marked improvement, marked improvement. The majority of these patients did great in this trial. And so the question then is, why is it this publication came out uh, virtually the same week as Lou Gehrig's obituary came out? How do you, how do you reconcile that? And I think that, that you can. Uh, I think that, and this is a good, helpful piece of information in deciding how to conduct clinical trials and clinical research. I think the problem here are several. Number one, um, it's an uncontrolled study. So there's no controls. So you hear people talk about, well, do we have any controls? And patients often say, we, why do we have to have placebo controls? Why can't we just all get the active drug? And I understand that point of view, but if you really want to know for sure if something works or not, it's good to have controls. And then you need to have blinding, where the evaluators don't know if the patient's on the real drug or the placebo, and the patients don't know, because we're all biased. The very best clinicians, it's proven, they're biased. They, if they know the patient's on the active drug, they want it to work, they score the patients better. Patients do the same thing. If they know they're on a placebo or active drug, they interpret their situation differently. And in this case, Wexler was a very kind doctor, had great interpersonal skills. His patients loved him. And some of them, um, the stories are out there, they didn't want to let him down. They didn't want to let the old man down. They knew that he's such a nice guy, this is important to him, so they would tell him they were doing better even though they weren't. And so uh, this is, I think, a very good example of why we have to at least think through, do we have controls? Do we have blinding? 
are we really sure that the results mean what, what, that we, uh, what, what in fact is reality? So we're at first base, know how to make the diagnosis. Uh, we know something about management. Got a couple of drugs that slow the disease down a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. So we got some options. Management is uh, kind of the, the village uh, comment. It's, it's no, no one doctor can take care of these patients. They have trouble with hands, arms, speech, swallowing, breathing. Um, some have trouble with cognition. Uh, and so we need a team. We need uh, about 12 different types of professionals, and they have to work collaboratively as a team to make this uh, a, a program that uh, provides effective comprehensive care. And so IU has a comprehensive uh, ALS multidisciplinary clinic. It's recognized by the ALS Association nationally. And that's essential. Uh, and it's multi-departmental. It's not just neurology. So physical medicine rehabilitation, their team is in there along with us. And that's uh, uh, essential to give patients and their families optimal management. Um, what we don't know for sure is what the cause is of the disease. You'd think that would be known, but it's not known, except for a few important exceptions. And then we don't know how to fix it. And so that's the work that needs to be done. Uh, in terms of cause, the, where the cause is known really comes out of the genetic area. About 5 to 10% of these patients have a genetic form, runs in every generation of their family. This is much like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, where 5 or 10% are genetic. The genes that cause it are known, and uh, they can be measured. And so uh, those particular uh, subgroups of patients represent uh, the group that's probably the most exciting target for treatment. Uh, and um, so uh, if you have an extra piece of DNA or unwanted DNA making some kind of mutant uh, protein, uh, it's, um, it's possible to selectively uh, construct uh, a piece of interference RNA that'll lock up that stuff, the, the unwanted uh, DNA so it doesn't produce some unwanted protein and free up um, uh, normal uh, cell function. And that's the new wave of trying to attack each of these individual genetically based uh, forms of ALS. And these are studies that are uh, currently um, ongoing. They're, uh, they're starting up and making progress in patients with ALS. A couple of articles on the superoxide dismutase patients from the New England Journal of Medicine from just a couple of weeks ago showing that there are some things you can measure in, in patients that uh, suggest this could be actually working. This may actually work. Very exciting. Uh, for 25 years, since 1995, ALS clinical trials have been conducted here at IU. And um, uh, these are some uh, that go back to 95. Some of them were big multi-center national, international studies. Some were conducted just here. Somewhere like Talampanel was here in Hopkins. Uh, some of them uh, are not drug treatment trials. One involves art therapy, and we're, we're, we need to get some better treatments. We're willing to look at anything. Yeah, so that's the past. Uh, the present is these are the four clinical trials involving uh, uh, medical therapies that we're currently involved with at IU. And the future includes uh, us uh, bringing in... Uh, uh, some of these very strategic uh, protocols for treating patients with specific underlying types of genetically based ALS, uh, including the antisense oligonucleotides. We're doing studies uh, uh, to look at uh, metabolism of patients to try to find the mechanism of, of their vulnerability. Is there something about the environment that makes them vulnerable to certain toxins, uh, the exposomics? We've got uh, some studies in neuroprotective drugs and a phase two study of a um, drug that comes from the, uh, the beehives of New Zealand. Uh, the propolis that's in the, that makes the beehives of New Zealand hard to destruct and hard to wear out has uh, certain constituents that have neuroprotective properties. And here at IU, uh, that uh, has been studied uh, to, to, to demonstrate benefit, not only in mice, but now uh, safety in normal healthy human volunteers and in phase 1b studies in patients with ALS with phase 2 studies uh, coming up. We, we, we think maybe this disease has multiple causes and has several different factors that could come into play. The same theory holds for Parkinson's disease and for uh, Alzheimer's disease. This is the missing uh, piece of the puzzle for the last 24 years up until a year ago. So this is Brian Perchala. He joined the faculty here in the past year. And he's the Sherry L. Sonneborn Professor in ALS Research. So for 
24 years, we had a bunch of clinicians seeing patients uh, involved with clinical trials, trying to think up ways to treat patients. But to be fair, the average clinician, the average neurologist, we're not basic scientists. And we have, uh, we can't be. We, we, and we need somebody who can really focus on the basic science, try to find out what's the mechanism for the disease, what are the various steps that occur to make the motor neurons fall apart and age prematurely, and how to identify the targets that would be um, logical to go after for, um, for therapeutic intervention. So now we have basic science here at the IU Neuroscience Center with the clinicians. And uh, this is only the beginning now of a really new era of trying to find the actual cause or mechanisms for the disease and then get some uh, really good uh, options for treatment. I was just showing some of Brian's work. He's able to show nerves, uh, the nerve muscle interface, the muscle itself, changes in ALS patients and others and everything from inflammation and the immune system to genetic uh, regulation and modification in ALS motor nerves uh, with a variety of, uh, of really important uh, insights that I think are gonna make IU central to getting, um, to, to getting uh, uh, this disease where it's much more effectively treatable. The Sonneborns are um, uh, an amazing uh, family. Uh, Sherry was affected with this illness, and uh, her wish was to find something that would fix it. And um, if not going to work for her in time, for somebody else, the next generation people to get this. So they actually um, did the grunt work at working with the School of Medicine to provide the funding necessary to establish this endowed chair for uh, Dr. Perchala. Uh, and so, uh, like a lot of things, it's a, it's a teamwork. It's, it's the patients, it's their family, the community, the School of Medicine, basic researchers, clinicians, everybody kind of working together to get to a point where we've got something better. All right, so here's the patient. The good news is that this uh, doctor has fasciculations in the first dorsal interosseous muscle. That's the one between the thumb and the finger and the little finger, uh, and so these are muscles supplied by the ulnar nerve. And so it's not uncommon if you're uh, a hardworking person, your elbows are on the table, your elbows are resting uh, to irritate the ulnar nerve at the elbow, and those are the muscles that'll twitch and flicker. Uh, and uh, this patient had no weakness on exam, uh, no reflex abnormalities, no other findings for something serious. So this was a benign form of fasciculation, which it nearly always is if the main complaint that brings someone is, is fasciculation. So we're not at the home plate uh, with this disease. Uh, we're about, I'd say, second base uh, with what's coming along. And I think the next five years are going to be huge trying to get us so we're closer to, to getting to home. Thank you very much.